Uh, good afternoon. My name is Enrico Riley. I'm chair of Studio Art. <clears throat> and welcome to the first lecture uh, of the fall term. Uh, today we are pleased to have the artist Lucy Mink as our speaker. Lucy is also our artist in residence this term and has an amazing exhibition of paintings uh, in the Jaffe Freed Gallery in the Hopkins Center. Uh, after the lecture, please uh, join us for a reception. Uh, it's in the Hopkins Center um, right as you come in. I encourage students to get to know Lucy during her residency here through November and to get to know her work, which will be up through November 11th. Students, if you would like to make an appointment to meet Lucy, please email artistsinresidence at dartmouth.edu. At this moment, I would also like everyone to know that in addition to Lucy's show here at Dartmouth, she also has a concurrent show titled Lucy Mink, Recent Paintings at Big Town Gallery in Rochester, Vermont. Uh, the opening reception is Saturday, September 22nd at 5 p.m. Also opening this afternoon in the Strauss Gallery is Majuba at Dartmouth, an exhibition organized and curated by Professor Jack Wilson, featuring a collaborative project between the studio of Eric Van Hove in Marrakesh, Morocco, and various Dartmouth students. Before we get started, I'd like to ask everyone to please turn off all electronic devices at this point, out of courtesy for our lecture, lecturer. Excuse me. Lucy Mink was born in New Jersey and recently lived in New York City and Syracuse, New York, until 2011 when she moved to Kentucky, New Hampshire. Lucy received her BFA from the Savannah College of Art and Design in 1991 and an MFA from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design in 1995. She's had solo exhibitions at David Finley Jr. Gallery in New York, New York, Adrian Duckworth Museum here in Meriden, New Hampshire. Uh, also works um, at uh, Outlet Fine Art in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, these are just a few selections of her solo exhibitions. Group exhibitions include uh, an, an exhibition called Minerva, curated by Aaron Goldberger, Betty Tompkins, Carolyn Tilliard, and Anna Marie Cuvas at Cuvas Tillard uh, Projects in New York, New York. Uh, she was also in an exhibition called Mother Popcorn, uh, a wonderful James Brown song, for those of you who do not know, uh, at Big Medium in Austin, Texas, Insomnia in Pelham, New York at the Pelham Art Center, and Art in America at Ocean Terrace Hotel in Miami, Florida. Again, these are just a few of her group exhibitions. Uh, just a few of her reviews include uh, a review by Sharon Butler uh, in the online publication Two Coats of Paint, Blast of Color, Mink, Dolnik, and Outlet at Outlet Gallery. Eti Yanif uh, also reviewed her work, uh, A Dialogue Between Art and Life, Suggestion That is a Dream, on Arts in, Bu in Bushwick uh, Arts blog. She was reviewed by Carolyn Johansson, Thaw at McGowan Fine Arts, Thaw the Conquered Monitor uh, in February 2014, and also uh, by Carrie Smith. Uh, strangely Familiar Places at Post Road Magazine. Lucy is also the distinguished uh, recipient of a Pollock Krasner Foundation grant. In 2007, she was also voted Best in Show at Bag Gallery in Brooklyn, New York. Lucy's work has been described by Etienne Yanif as paintings that resemble abstracted mindscapes where space and time merge into a fluid state of becoming. Her vibrating colors form shapes that subvert any preconceived notions of categorization, disrupting the viewer's perception of foreground and background, portrait and landscape. At first glance, the vert vert vertical paintings understandable reads like a portrait where at, at, uh, amorphic shapes intersect and coalesce into a cohesive, translucent entity against the sharp-edged bright yellow background. Yet, as in Mink's other paintings, the blurred border between order and disorder uh, teases the viewer in many ways. 
please help me to welcome the painter Lucy Mink Cavello. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. But I'm really glad to be here. Thank you, Enrico. Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> so um, uh, I am available when you want to get in touch with me here. I'm here. I'm glad to be here. So um, I'm going to start by um, telling you about uh, work that I um, did a long time ago. And um, uh, this is a work that I did. Um, going all the way back to high school. And uh, before I even talk about that, I want to talk about how um, this is something I've always done, even in second grade, was uh, a weird experience for me when I um, made a sculpture out of toothpicks. And um, we were allowed to use, I had an art teacher that gave every student 500 toothpicks a box. And um, after we did that, um, with, you can use glue and make whatever you wanted, and then he would spray paint it right in the classroom. This was the 1970s, <laughs> and it was the most exciting project for me <laughs> I can remember. So I, um, I feel like from that moment on, I must have done something right because I was taken out of certain academic classes with a couple of other people um, all the way through eighth grade to go to a thing called special art and in the public schools in New Jersey. So um, this kind of drawing I started doing in high school uh, started from there, and I was always making up things out of my head uh, in a more, I didn't know to call it abstraction, but it was always something abstract. And I enjoyed it very much, and it was a, I, th I believe it was a type of escape um, but it was also something I was very comfortable doing and it came naturally to me and I have stuck with it ever since. And um, I went down to Savannah and I did all the traditional stuff as well, but I kept doing this as well. So, so in, um, in the 1980s, I went into Soho a few times as a teenager with a friend's mom. Um, that was the first time I experienced um, certain artists like Keith Haring and uh, um, Kenny Scharf, and I took those artists with me off to SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design, and that was a big change for me to go from the suburbs of New Jersey all the way down to Georgia, and not, that was around 1987, and I was learning about various um, Last Judgment paintings as well. I mean, I was in art history and Renaissance art history and um, 20th century art history and a lot of other classes that I love taking. And so I mixed a few of those things in this painting. So this was my largest work in undergrad that I could manage. And it was my take on Kenny Scharf and Last Judgment paintings. So in, it's very strange, but you know, I was 19. <laughs> but I appreciate that my brain was trying to come up with something that had humor and also I, yeah, okay, no. <laughs> All right, so these are other smaller works from that time period and um, they're uh, mostly marker, watercolor, and pen and ink, and I had one professor there that was, a, he was an illustration professor, and I stuck with it being an illustration major there, mostly because of him. He broke a few rules and remained true to himself. And a few small group of us took every class we could with him. And we were not as invested in illustration as we were heavily invested in spending time learning about the world from him, as well as art history. And we challenged 
he challenged us creatively and we had great political discussions and this was around 1990, 1991 and some of you might know some things going on back then, what was going on, but it was a time before the internet so there was a lot of things that we discussed and how we were all living in Georgia and different people came from different places and we had a lot of, you know, art and illustration and things that we needed to talk about. So it was great. <laughs> I got a lot out of being in Georgia besides. I, was, I learned a lot from working in restaurants there and um, the whole experience, I wouldn't trade it for the world. <laughs> so, okay. Um, then I went home to New Jersey and I decided to look at grad programs and I ended up in Philadelphia for a semester. And this is one of the paintings I'm gonna show you that I did from Philadelphia. <laughs> and it was a weird and beautiful place. And uh, I had a lot of, about three months there in a art ed program. And I read a book called um, Beyond the Brain by Stanislav Grof that really stayed with me from that experience and I highly recommend it. <laughs> so this is, I'm going back a long time. So then my memory of where I come from, these things all informed, I feel like the painter that I am today. So, so um, let me see what comes next. Okay, so there's a big change. <laughs> So um, it was about 1993, I started, I left the program in Philadelphia and I started to, um, I worked for two years and I, I looked around and I started the, uh, my MFA at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. So I headed out to Minneapolis not knowing anyone at 24 years old and it was very strange at first and I did adjust and I got a ton of compliments from certain friends of mine and people in New Jersey that I could just go places that I didn't know anyone. And I feel like it helped me a lot with painting and where I was going and forcing my art to go in different directions. So my first crit um, did not go so well. And I was last on a long Saturday and they changed that situation, but it was a brutal way to start the program. And, it, and when I look back on it, it, it was very helpful. It became obvious I had to try something new. And I connected with some senior painters and the library full of books since it was 1993. And email was still not really a thing. <laughs> so what helped me the most was uh, just eliminating colors and experimenting and um, here I have to I think I put these in the wrong order so hold on okay so see these two were some of the ones that I did there right in the beginning of grad school um, and they're about six feet by four feet and I um, was also listening to a um, German musician uh, Kasper Brotzman, who we would go see in concert a lot. Um, he's a guitarist and is kind of improvisational and we, he seemed to tour and go right to Minneapolis all the time and he had an album that came out in 1993 and it was fun to go see him and then, I don't know, his music influenced some of this work too. So we had, um, I have to go back to this one so then, one of my, this is, one of my roommates was from Alaska and her sister sent her a bunch of rabbit fur scraps. And so, um, you know, with my constant search for what to do next and then I glued them onto a canvas and painted around them with dark reds and blacks in an attempt to get somewhere. This was, you know, really feeling like, where am I going in grad school? I'm not sure and, and you have to think like I was doing all this other tight more using every color kind of work and I had to leave it all behind and so when I started just e experimenting really. So then I kind of went to this one. Um, towards the end of my first year 
of grad school, I got to this point. I think this one was about six feet by eight feet. And I was starting to get a lot more confidence in what I, what the paint was doing. And things got quieter. I feel like there was, um, sometimes I see my paintings in sound, uh, the colors and the um, lines and the forms. So to me, this is quieter. <laughs> I started um, isolating forms, and um, I really ended my first year pretty happy about this painting, and then I had another one, too, but I don't have a slide of it. I mean, I mean a JPEG. These were all slides, and then I had them turned into, <laughs> so I don't have an image of that one. So um, my second year of grad school, I... Um, did some larger paintings as well, and then I also had these other ones with a lot of texture, and I added a lot more layers and um, collage elements, and I just still was um, trying anything, you know. And it was, it was just a real positive for me. I really, I really was not thinking about what was going to happen afterwards, not at all. <laughs> so. And this is like our super tiny painting, and as you can see by the nails. And it, I don't know. So wait, okay. And, all right, so then that was pretty much at the end of that. So um, something I took from one of my artist statements back then, because I still saved some of those. Um, I was trying to paint static combined with something that looked sticky, if, if that makes sense. <laughs> so. So after graduating, and because of my great passion for Eva Hesse, I made sculptures for about a year. Um, I, didn't, uh, I didn't really have much of studios. I usually was working in an apartment still in Minneapolis for two years, and, and then in uh, New York City for a while in smaller spaces. But um, the materials were too expensive for what I wanted to do with sculpture. So... Um, these are some of the sculptures from that time period. So, and I kind of, um, I had a good time. <laughs> but I just, I mean, even when I got the, the material to make that rubber, so that rubber, the clear rubber, and made that, into a mold and stuff. It, it was more than I could afford, and, and I did it, but I, I wanted to go bigger, and I wanted to make more, and I wanted to add, and my ideas were bigger than I could imagine, and then at the same time, it was, you know, so I just stopped, <laughs> and painting's always fine, so I love painting. So then um, there's a big gap uh, of work because <coughs> I did still do a lot of other painting and uh, I chose not to, I cho I'm choosing not to share a bunch of paintings on here because I think it's healthy. <laughs> so I did burn a lot of uh, artwork over the years. Um, I have two children that are 12 and 13 and um, the years prior to having them, there's some work that I wasn't that happy with. And then um, after I had them, um, I really wanted to, after um, my son was about one years old and I started painting again, um, this is one of the first paintings I was happy with. And so it was a matter of, okay, now I'm ready to get back into painting. So there's, um, it's not so much of a gap, it's just that I, don't care about that work, so. so it's okay. I think that's an okay thing to do. So this is the first painting I did after my kids were born that I liked. Um, and uh, I, the title is um, um, I'm in there somewhere, and it was really s about nine inches by nine inches. And um, I kept working sort of small in those years and um, 
I left behind uh, the mediums that I was using in my paints. I left behind all the collage materials and I just used paint. And then this is your stuff is my stuff. And it's another small one. And it's from 2009. And if I don't remember, to, I'm going to do my best to remember all the titles. But, and this is under here. And um, this is from 2010 as well. And um, this was a real good time for me because I felt like it was, some of these paintings for me felt like a combination of all the things I put in to the work I did in high school mixed with the w things I did in Savannah and everything I also got out of grad school into work that I finally wanted to make. And it just took me until 2009 to get there. <laughs> so, um, and I just, with all the different experimenting I did with materials, it just felt right, like I knew how to use paint better finally. And this one's um, The Night and the Day. And these are all like um, either 20, they're all smaller than 20 inches by 16 or somewhere around there. And that one's another story, and that one's like nine by 10. And it was more like just being also conscious of my time and um, having, having to share my time was almost healthier for me for some reason in what I was going to do with it painting wise and what I was gonna leave out and it turned, for me it worked better. It, I know that's not the same for everybody but it's, that's what worked. Okay and this one is um, called Goldberg Center and uh, which is a humorous title that um, my, uh, a kind of a humorous story I was just telling Jerry actually is that my husband sometimes wants to come up with titles for my paintings and he's, and I don't really let him, but this one I did let, I, this is the one that I have given him because it's, Goldberg Center is a place where you go to, for <laughs> ma ma marriage therapy <laughs> in Syracuse University. <laughs> But it's free, it's, you don't pay if, <laughs> if you're, a, and the counselor is a student, a grad student. So it's kind of hilarious because it's, you know, it's like, well, okay. And we had a good time going there at the time because he was a grad student. And, you know, so it was kind of fun. And at, when after I finished the painting, he looked at me and he said, oh, you should call that Goldberg Center. <laughs> so, and so it stuck. <laughs> So, and this one is, um, this is the best day ever. And uh, that's taken from my daughter saying that at age five, which from the backseat of the car, and I have no idea why she said that, but it was charming and I thought, oh. <laughs> so. Um, so some of these became more about writing and poetry and um, I showed at Jeffrey Young Gallery around the same time, who, and he's a poet, and it was one of those things where I've always liked poetry, and, and my titles became more important to me as well. So, and also as documentation. So this one is called Mono, and um, my daughter had Mono as a five-year-old, and I, this was the only painting I finished that, that month, so. <laughs> And it's only eight by nine. So, but it seemed important to remember that. So, all right. So there's a whole bunch of titles I have that are about the future. And um, I keep doing uh, different paintings um, with titles about the future. And this is the first one I did in 2009 called Glimpse. And, uh, and so if you could imagine like when you want to know what somebody's going to be like 10 years later or 20 years later or 30 years later. So that one relates to that. And uh, when I get to another one, I'll tell you. But, and um, 
I didn't put them all in order because I didn't do them all in order. So <laughs> this one is um, kind of funny. Um, it's a uh, something. It's a uh, about the. Um, I, I don't know if anyone here is from New Jer North Jersey, but <laughs> it's about the Bambergers department stores in New, New Jersey, and um, it's a. Do you remember the Bam? It's called Do You Remember the Bambergers, and um, it was a department store in New Jersey, and there was also the Alexanders, and what's kind of funny about it is that I added it to my my presentation the other night, and at the same time, a friend of mine from New Jersey who's a painter sent me an article about the Alexanders, so at the same time, which was kind of strange. And uh, it's a it's a guy was talking to me in, in South Orange, and he asked me about the Bambergers, and it was the way he said it that was a really New Jersey conversation. You could only, so. <laughs> um, this one is um, Fear and Safety, and I did a series of paintings. I, I don't really work in series, but I did title series of paintings about um, in 2013, I did six paintings with all the titles relate to fear, and and it was mostly about. Um, there's one that's titled "Run Hide," and and they're not about um, school shootings or anything like that. They're mostly about um, how your kids are feeling in when they're little about uh, like a thunderstorm or just basic stuff. And and when I look at the titles today, they take on like other meanings. It's very strange because I. It, it's not, they seem so much more dramatic. So this one is just fear and safety. So, and this one is, uh, you are all allowed in the rejected area. And that was my comment on um, how people deal with rejection and artists and other people and all in lots of rejection out there and how it's, it doesn't, there's areas for, it doesn't matter basically. And, there could be a painting about it, so. <laughs> All right, so. Um, this one's titled Cherry Vanilla because that was the only flavor ice cream my grandfather buy. <laughs> so it just seemed charming. I needed to title something like that. And it, a lot of times the title will happen based on just something about the painting, and sometimes it's something that's happened at the same time. Yeah. So um, this one I really enjoy because it's uh, the mystery of the missing strong foundation. And there was a series of uh, children's books that were um, like that, I, that were not that engaging that my kids were reading when they were in first grade, like the mystery of the missing baseball bat or the mystery of the you know missing cat or the mis And uh, I thought it would be interesting to have more of a take on something psychologically missing. So I titled it, The Mystery of the Missing Strong Foundation. Okay, so this one's titled Sleeping, um, and that's it. <laughs> this one's about like 11, 14, so both of the last two were 11 by 14 inches. They're not that big, they're smaller. Okay, so this one's bigger, it's like uh, 60 by 72, and it's titled Swim. It's really just swim for no other reason, but it's a good thing. <laughs> and this one is uh, Though Nothing. And this one was Hangouts. And, uh, and I, that was more of a documentation of the first time my daughter sent me a request to be in hangouts with her and I thought it was such an honor <laughs> and so this one is um look up and um I um it's based on a song and uh it has um it's kind of a darker kind of song but you have to um 
we'd have to hear the song to. It's, uh, it's um, Alex Chilton's um, old bandmate. Trying to blank on his name. Sorry. <laughs> so this one is um, another one that I did that reminded me of when I first did this one. I, it reminded me of the Florida Keys, and which I had spent a, a, some time in in the in the late '80s. Um, the Florida Keys are different now than they were then, but uh, we used to go down there from college, and because um, we were in Georgia, and we would drive down there and camp, and just camp out in tents and stuff, and find different places to camp for the weekend. And it was a really, um, you can't really do those kind of things again, kind of time in your life, you know. And so when I first finished it, it just, you know, had that, you know. Time that look to it that just brought back those memories, and so that's what it reminds me of. And say, okay, so I have some drawings real that on here that I've done, and uh, a lot of times I'll do more drawing when um, I can't seem to uh, paint as easily, or I'm not in a place where I'm painting, and uh, or a, or. If I'm on a trip or I'm on a train or in a bus. I've done a lot of draw drawings on the bus rides to New York City. So I try to use those um, time periods as studio time. So if I'm traveling, um, so these are all smaller pencil drawings. It's sometimes kind of strange, too, to like force yourself to draw in a situation where you're sitting right next to somebody else or you're in a confined space. And it's always a good idea, too, to like make sure you have all your pencils sharpened because you don't want to make a lot of noise either. And you're not. So I try to make sure I'm not using any loud materials because I'm not, I don't want to be a noisy passenger. <laughs> Some people will say to me, why do you take the bus to New York? I'm like, are you kidding me? It's like six hours of studio time that I didn't realize I would have. <laughs> yeah. So this one's titled Winter, and it's, down, it's in the show. And uh, this was one of the, the first painting, um, well, the last painting I did in 2016. And uh, you know, that just seems significant to me. <laughs> okay, so here's another painting with a title from the for the future. Is I titled it to 2038 because I just decided to give it a title 20 years from now. Um, it was a spontaneous decision, and uh, this one's called "It's Not True." And this is another one with my take on the future titles. It's called Perceived Briefly, which is another way of saying glimpse. <laughs> okay, and this one's called Talking. And um, there's something I do. Uh, Sometimes I'm on the phone, and it's mentioned in the catalog a little bit, because I did have a conversation with um, Lisa Beck, who wrote one of my um, essays. Uh, I, I will often paint um, if I'm on the phone, and I know other artists that do that, um, if I'm in my studio and I'm talking to, it's to someone. And um, I, didn't, um, I did work on this painting that way, but I did decide to title this painting Talking because at the moment, it wasn't titled, but then en Enrico and Jerry were in my studio the first time they came, and they were deciding about paintings a bit, and they were both talking in front of it. So I said, that's why <laughs> it's called talking. <laughs> 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 uh, 
And this one is called uh, Fall In. And uh, and this last one is called uh, So I Turn Myself to Face Me, which is uh, from David Bowie's song and changes. And you know there's, he also says, glimpse in that. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a certain amount of when you're facing, you, you know, you, so you, I love that line, so I turned myself face me because you're also, you should always look back at yourself and see what you're doing, you know, to go forward and to the future, to go the next direction. So, and that's it. And Let me get the lights on. Questions? Good? Yeah. I have a question um, about your titles. Um, since you put them on afterwards, and they, you say they matter a lot to you, um, what do you hope for them to do? If, or do you want somebody, for example, to read the title before they see the game? Uh, and and what, what, what do you want the titles to do in relationship to the game? Or, or somebody's experience? Um, what do I want the titles to do in experience to the painting? Um, it so it doesn't. Uh, I I get a, I love it when someone can look when they see the titles too, and they see that there's a title and a painting. But it doesn't matter to me if they don't know what it's about or if they don't make a connection. If they see it as a it's kind of, I'm not the kind of person that picks apart poetry and needs to know what it means. And, and I enjoy poetry and I enjoy reading stuff, but I don't need to know the meaning of everything. Um, it, I love it when someone just enjoys the paintings as is. Like, and that's, but I also don't need a ton of writing on painting either. So It's hard, you know, it, it can, it's either way for me. I mean, I just enjoy personally titling them. For me, it's, it's almost like a cataloging my way, it's my way of keeping track, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the presentation. My question had to do more with whether the audio, the audience, or the reception of your work has influenced your process because you presented very thoroughly your influences and the process of making the drawings and the paintings. Uh, but I wondered if uh, the normal audience, like everyday audience, or the, the gallery audience, or the curators, or gallery owners, or the art system, had any impact in the decisions you made about your work? Who else other than your personal um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm trying to figure out how what you're saying. Like, is it? You mean if like something changed what I did later on because of like a whether the, there were some reactions from the audience mm. with how they based on the titles? Or well, you know, the work that I I can give you again, like the work that I destroyed. Like, I didn't like some of the way it was uh, made, and I just was unhappy with how I was putting things together, um, even just physically. Like, I just got to a point where I was experimenting and experimenting, enjoying certain things, but I didn't like the outcome anymore, and I felt like I wanted to go to another level with my painting, and I also just wanted to get back to... You know, when I look back at like a, the marker drawing I showed in the beginning and I'm like, well, I still have that. That's fine. That's held up for all these years. So I wanted to go back. I wanted to make sure I was making work that, you know, so. And I just didn't want to but keep, I don't know, m making work that had. Like, for an example, I made a painting for, um, uh, in grad school that had a glue on it, 
that kept dripping. <laughs> And it was not, I mean, it never dried. And so, I mean, there was something kind of beautiful about it, but it was like, it never dried. And it, there was eventually a box on the floor for it to keep dripping into. <laughs> but I didn't want to keep doing things that were along those lines anymore. I just was done with it. Like, I just m matured past it that I, you know, and spending time and effort on things that were not, you know, does that make sense? Uh, yeah, just, just wanted to know more about I mean, how uh. an artist has certain challenges when presenting the work to the audience. Um, it's a big moment for the artist to come out right, and exhibit and share this <laughs> big art work. And sometimes the audience whoever is this audience doesn't get feel what you wish to share and I wonder if that type of interaction how they receive it and whether you got some feedback from friends or galleries nah not really I mean I think you deal more with I think I mean a lot of artists I think have just dealt with re you deal with rejection and you never really get an answer that much <laughs> you don't get you know and you get and then you it's in you it's on you to like figure out what you're going to do next and whether or not you just want to keep going and either you want to or you don't you know so uh, you know <coughs> yeah yeah no, I know. Uh, no, I never did that. Yeah, that's a yeah. 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 No, but I've used the drawings as a. I mean, I think I've done a lot of drawings and watercolors. They've the water. I didn't show any watercolors here, but they definitely influence the paintings. So it's really helped, like, so. And I plan on doing a lot of watercolors while I'm here, so. Um, yeah, I really love the presentation and a lot of your early works works you've done recently. But my question was um, how, you mentioned that you experiment a lot as you're painting and then that kind of becomes your final piece. Do you often just experiment and go with it or do you have some sort of idea before you're starting? Some, some sort of like yeah, no, I usually don't have much of an idea at first, but I've been, I feel like now I've been making paintings so long that I'm not, it's like you kind of already have a lot of things, like language already there and that you've worked with, colors, forms, and I already, sometimes you have to actually force yourself away from something if you want to change something I mean I think Enrico understands that sometimes when you are like you don't want to do the same thing again and so you're almost sometimes you have to switch your gears into like to get something new out of yourself if you don't want to repeat the same moves you know so I think I'm just more open to like um I've learned a lot about m material usage over the years and so I feel like I'm better at like changing things in it well <laughs> with the materials and knowing how it's going to come along and okay and I don't know I don't have to really burn things anymore if I don't want to <laughs> yeah um, Lucy can you, can you talk a little bit about um, the sort of different <laughs> roles that you have in your life and the different priorities that we have, that, that a lot of people have different priorities and roles that they have to take, and how you manage to um, prioritize your, your art, your practice, um, your painting, um, and how you manage to keep your interior um, intact in the midst of all of the competing responsibilities. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's 
you know, I think it's, uh, I mean, a lot of people have done it. I think you have to just, um, I think that's the other reason when I first got rid of like the medium and the other stuff in my paint, when I had kids and my studio became in my house, it was one of those things where they were, they were young and I knew if I was going to make this work and I was going to do things right and I wanted to use cadmiums and cobalt and all the other colors, I was like, well, I'm going to have to make tiny paintings in the limited amount of time I had with my kids when they were really young. And, and I felt like it was um, a great way to have some success with what I was going to make and not worry about trying to make, have an eight-hour studio day. I mean, I really didn't, and it was, it was so much healthier for me to, like, not worry about because I also didn't want to be not a parent to my kids. And so... Um, as they've gotten older and our relationship has evolved, I have more time, lo a lot more time. And then, you know, and you, you know, everybody has to do different other jobs and you, and you find the balance, um, in, but I also, um, sometimes I work really well with the half hour here, half hour there and leaving things and coming back to things. So, and I've tried to, um, having that um, home studio for me was helpful because I could also put things around and even if I wasn't working on them, they were right in front of my face. And uh, this is the right time for me to be here because of the age my kids are, you know? So it's a nice thing that's going on. So, but I, I you know, I think it just, um, you, you just have to figure it out. Um, and not, I think you just can't take on too much and you have to kind of change your work to fit the thing that you're, the hours that you have in some ways. Because, I mean, in, in some ways, the way you went to Italy and you made it work and, um, you know, there's, there's only so much you can do with, uh, and they're not going to be, they'll be 18 all of a sudden and, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, so what influenced your decision to go to grad school for art and how was the creative how do you like experience the creative process uh, with like in class assignments different from like out of class assignments okay um, that's a good question I went to grad school for art because it, well, it was 1993 when I went and then because I went to undergrad for illustration and art history. So when I went to grad school, it was because I wanted to paint a lot more. And I didn't do much painting in undergrad. Like I did, I did it on the side. So I was always painting, but it was like a side project. And then I was going to all my illustration classes and doing like really creative drawings and all this other work. But any painting I did, and I took painting electives, but then... As soon as I graduated, I didn't do any illustration jobs or di I didn't do, I wasn't an illustrator. So, um, and then I decided to try to work in New Jersey for a while um, and think about what I wanted to do for grad school. And I started at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia for one semester in art ed. And I was in an art education program for with um, students that um, uh, were, n were all going to be teachers, art teachers, but none of them were really, um, and I don't want to, I, I don't want to diss art teachers, but they, were, none of the ones I was around at that time were artists making art, so then it didn't feel like the right place for me at the right time. So I loved Philadelphia and I liked some of the people I met, but I left that program. If University of Arts had an MFA at the time, I just would have switched into it, but they didn't. And so I just looked around and it was really great for me to go all the way out to Minneapolis anyway. And, um, and I just, I, I don't know, I couldn't really think of something else that I would have gone to grad school for. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else?
Thank you.